Hello everyone and welcome back to World of Warship Splits with Terry. Today we are looking at the final ship in the new German battlecruiser line at tier 10, the Schlieffen, obviously named after the general who was responsible for the somewhat famous Schlieffen plan. And somebody in the comments actually uh, pointed out into the last to review on tier 9 for the, uh, for the Prince Ruprecht that uh, there's a bit of a history between Schlieffen and Ruprecht. Now, not directly, and uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to go down this route because there's an awful lot to say about this ship that I haven't said already about the whole battlecruiser line. So, uh, Schlieffen made this plan, and the plan effectively involved um, to, to walk around the Maginot line, <laughs> or the defensive line, between France and Germany in order not to have to push through, through it, and instead to go through uh, Belgium and the Netherlands and simply outflank the French, uh, while also sort of assuming that uh, the Russian Empire would be too busy recovering from losing against the Japanese and the slight infamy that came out of that one, in order to not have to deal with two fronts. Schlieffen was, not, was no longer actually in power in any way. By the time this was actually implemented, that was Moltke the Younger. But uh, Prinz Ruprecht at the time was responsible for the Bavarian section of the German army. And his job was to hold the French flank. He didn't like that very much. Uh, so when he was told that um, the Russians... Surpri uh, surpri to nobody's great surprise, had somewhat recovered because it was a couple of years <laughs> between the actual making of the plan and the eventual implementation, uh, that he was needed to, uh, could you please send over some people to the east to defend the German borders. Now, the east would not be Bavaria, the east would be Prussia. So, so Ruprecht said, no, I'm not having any of that. <laughs> I'm not defending the Prussians, excuse me. He was having dreams of his own of, um, you know, a monarchic element of sorts that would involve uh, the grand Bavaria. So he said no, which means Moltke then had to pull people off from the actual north and thrust through Belgium, which really, honestly, wouldn't have really worked anyway because they left the Netherlands out and the, the whole thing was extremely optimistic in the first place. But uh, he then proceeded to attack the French rather than just holding them in place, which also really just did not fit into the plan. And uh, I believe there's, uh, one of the officers got captured who then gave away the plan. So even if there had been a chance that the plan would have worked, it ended up not working. And the whole thing went into a two front stalemate, which eventually uh, led to the downfall of Germany in the First World War, which then led to Versailles and a lot of other things. And you know where, where the history goes, but uh, it's fascinating. So um, Ruprecht, to a degree, has been uh, messing with the Schlieffen plan, even though not with Schlieffen himself. And presumably even without his interference, the whole thing wouldn't have really worked out. But still, it's an interesting little bit of history there. So thank you for pointing that out, that there was actually a relationship. I was aware of the Schlieffen plan, obviously, but I didn't know that Prince Ruprecht had actually some <laughs> some involvement there. Uh, go, talking about the ship, the, sh the ship itself now. Um, what is the difference between the Prince Ruprecht and the Schlieffen at tier nine and ten? Let's have a very quick look. The Schlieffen does get the uh, secondary overload three, which gives us thirty percent uh, reload and range for twenty five seconds, compared to twenty five for twenty seconds. So it's nice, it's not a massive difference, but it's other, other than that, the skills are identical. Uh, the Schlieffen has a noticeably larger hit point pool and a slightly better torpedo damage reduction. Other than that, she's got pretty much a similar armor, at least from the values that we can see to the principal weight. Although I have to say, uh, she can sort of hold a little bit at times, uh, Especially if you manage to get something on the belt, uh, but we don't we don't know we don't know the actual detailed values. In terms of maneuverability, the Schlieffen is worse than the Prince Ruprecht, which is not a great surprise. So 16 seconds turn time, almost ugh, relatively large for a battlecruiser. 
but uh, we are getting the bored out version of the 406 millimeter guns these are technically the same guns only that uh, they've carved it a little bit larger to up to 420 millimeter and they are now only 50 colors in length they chopped a bit off on the, uh, on the end uh, instead of 52 but they reload faster they have a better range they strangely have a worse high explosive shell <laughs> than on the Prinz Ruprecht but in return get uh, a better armor piercing the 150s, we do get 16 of them, and that is a lot. They do have a faster reload, better range, and do more damage. The, uh, the 105 millimeters also have, have slightly multiplied. There are now 12 twins scattered all around the ship on the auto secondaries, and they have a slightly longer range and do a bit more damage as well. The torpedoes are well, mostly the same. They do a bit more damage and have a bit better range, but other than that, it's the same 16 set of torpedoes that you get. The AA is actually better. I mean, it's tier 10. It's not an AA monster, but it's a bit better than uh, on the Prinz Ruprecht, especially on the small caliber. And the concealment is a little bit worse, but for a battleship, especially at tier 10, still pretty good. Let's have a very quick look how she compares to the, uh, to the Friedrich der Große. And just in the matter of guns, because the Friedrich der Große also gets 420mm guns, but the guns on the Freddy are better. So there's that. They've got better range, they do more damage, and they reload faster. And if we compare her to the Große Kurfürst, just in terms of her secondaries, because we don't need to look at the other things, uh, the Kurfürst gets four twin 150mm, uh, the Schlieffen gets eight. And the ones on the Schlieffen are better. Plus, the ones on the Schlieffen can actually fire high explosive. The auto secondaries are better on the Kur first, the 120, uh, 128s. They do have the same range, but they do more damage and they have a 2% uh, fire chance. There's one thing, though, to say about the Schlieffen's auto secondary. So let's, uh, let's, let's pull that up quickly. Because this is a battle cruiser design, not a battleship design, and it's from the First World War. The 150mm secondaries are in these casemates here, built into the side of the hull which is a more kind of old-fashioned way of, of putting your secondaries. Which means that while you have four twin turrets on each side, you have a bit of an, an issue. They only really work if you're positioned like this. <laughs> if you're positioned like this, you only get, you only get the forward four uh, guns on target. And if you're positioned like that, you only get the rearward four guns on target. And straight ahead or straight in reverse, um, you not get any guns on target. If you slightly angle, then you start um, you start getting them on target. So, the 150 millimeter secondaries only really work well if you're giving full broadside, which is not something you want to be doing in a battle cruiser. And this reinforces again the playstyle of this being a very situational ship that needs to to be able to fight one on one engagements and then needs to disengage. Which brings us to what I've done with the thing. All right, um, you could improve your torpedo tubes. I wouldn't bother because uh, the torpedoes are very slow and while you get a lot of them, it takes them forever to reload. So I generally just use them if I have, if I have a safe shot, pretty much. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to improve the secondaries because the secondaries is what these ships are all about. And uh, one thing that people pointed out, and a fair few of you pointed out in the comments as well, I said, why not use the main battery mod 3? Now, I'm going to make a dedicated video about this, but my reasoning so far is it's only a 7% dispersion improvement. And this probably means a 7% reduction of the size of the ellipses within the, the, the which the shells are falling on target. And it's not going to make an awful lot of difference. I mean, honestly, if you look at the uh, precise aim one, just that has 20%, three times the value of this. That's where you start noticing a, a better dispersion. The 7% is not going to make an awful lot of difference by itself. It kind of stacks with all these. So if you've got a historical camo, which gives you 4%, you got the 7% from the mod, from the module, you got the precise aiming skill. That's when you start seeing these things. But, um, the historical camo doesn't actually give you that. We'll get to that in a moment. So I, I, I would still say that the secondary mod 2 is a very, very good choice because it uh, improves, again, the range on the secondaries and it also improves the secondary dispersion. And that nicely stacks with the close quarters combat expert captain skill. I am actually using the propulsion mod in 2. You could be sort of tempted to use the, um, deck protection or steering. 
I like the propulsion mod here because of the playstyle, because you kind of need to, you need to move, you need to get going, you need to be in positions where you can make these one-on-one -on -one fights happen. And the third one goes into concealment because uh, battle cruiser needs to. I need to be able to disengage. Now you could say, "Oh, but yes, Terry, you you're going to be shot at by Vermonts and Yamas and everything." Exactly. But in order for a Vermont or a Yamato to shoot at me, then it needs to see me first. <laughs> so if I can just stop firing my guns and go undetected, that is, um, and then gives me a chance to heal, reload, and get into better positions. That is a good thing to do. The historical camo, and I have put the historical camo on here because it's tier 10. And, um, you know, that's what you would do. It gives us hit points, main battery range, not dispersion, secondary range, and torpedo range. So, uh, all in all, good things. And the main battery range definitely could, could do with a little bit of a buff. So, that all in all gets us to uh, 56,000 hit points. Not the greatest armor out there, but workable. Uh, we have a 20 second time to full speed, which is not terrible for a battleship. And we have the we have the 150 millimeters at a nine kilometer range. And we've got the auto secondaries at almost seven. So that is pretty substantial. And then you can still buff that by 30% using the secondary overload. So which means that you can almost start firing your, your secondaries by the time you, you spot something. Uh, commander skills. I've put a tier 10 commander in here. I have not put the APCS skill in here yet because it takes a while to grind there. Not everyone has one, especially if you're going up for a new line. Uh, no, no real difference here in, in the skills. You, you can build it a bit more for tankiness. I'm still going with extinguisher instead of adrenaline rush, but um, it's a valid choice, I guess, as well. Uh, the close quarters combat expert is where it really where it really shines, and that's the another fifteen percent dispersion, which stacks nicely with the uh, with the module in the first slot. All right, I think we have uh, we have observed everything. So let's see the Schlieffen in battle. In the first game, we are in a five v five against Christopher Colombo, Pommern, Gearing, Shima, and Jutland, three destroyers. And we're playing fault line. <laughs> That's a lot of islands. So against destroyers, you are actually relatively effective. One of the problems that you're going to have against destroyers is that uh, in order to get all the 150s with armor piercing on, on target, you kind of need to give full broadside. And well, there are torpedoes in the water, but you do have the sonar, so that is relatively useful. Now, what are we going to do in this kind of scenario here? Uh, obviously, what we have to be careful about are... The, the two things that we have to be careful about are um, carriers and the big guns. Now, I'm hoping that the Friesland is scouting for me on this flank here, but it looks like the Friesland has no interest in doing that. Um, I am switching the main guns over to the high explosive at this point because there are five destroyers on the enemy team. Now, two of them are bots, but the ones that are not bots, I'm going to have to sort of deal with. And even with the concealment module, obviously, uh, destroyers can outspot you. But uh, it also allows me to know if a destroyer is in range. And if, I, if a destroyer can see me, he's in range of my 150s. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, well, this is about as far forward as we go. Someone, sh someone should be coming through that gap there. And um, given that I have no scouting here, and I am now spotted, so there is a destroyer. So I'm going to slow down. And I have a battleship to shoot at there. But uh, that's not quite what I'm interested in right now. Because A, I don't really have an angle. And okay, there is a Yugomo. That is not what's been... That's the Pommern up there. The Yugomo is not what's been spotting me. I know there's something else. So I'm just going to back off here a little bit and uh, see if we can spot who is who is after us. Secondary is obviously on armor piercing. And here you can kind of see the, the angles. As soon as I move out of flat broadside, I only get two or three of the turrets on target. Okay, there's a bot Fletcher. Uh, there's no, no real target that I'm interested in. I know that there's a destroyer here, but um, there isn't an awful lot that I can shoot at right now. I'm just kind of making sure at this point I might as well shoot at the bots because I've got nothing else to shoot at. I'm just making sure at this point that uh, this flank is holding because there's someone is sneaking around this flank, and I know that already. I know that someone's sneaking around this flank. There's the bot Yugomo, but put it back in reverse because there are going to be torpedoes in the water, 
And uh, we'll just we'll just eliminate that bot as we're here, but there's no reason to use the secondary overload for that. Uh, oh, suspicious smoke screen detected. Uh, Hydra up. <laughs> and, uh, where are your torpedoes? And who are you? Okay, let's see if we can get some blind shots into that smoke just to scare him off a bit. There come the torpedoes. And it's the Jutland. How do I know that? Well, they're coming in single file. <laughs> and that's where I would have been if I hadn't paid attention that there was a destroyer sneaking around and stalking me all this time. But now I have different problems because there's the Pommern coming around the corner. Hello, Mr. Pommern. I mean, the Pommern is only a tier 9, but um, unload the high explosive back to the armor piercing. And uh, we're gonna introduce the Pommern to our torpedoes. And the Pommern obviously hurts uh, because this is a fully broadside <laughs> and, uh The Pommern can, can, can and will do damage as well, but um, I think he didn't know that I have torpedoes. So uh, that is probably a dead Pommern, but we're gonna use the secondary overload for now. I've got three of them, might as well start using it. And the auto secondaries are also un <laughs> unloading absolute hell on this thing. He took out one of my torpedo tubes, and yeah, as you can see, even a Pommern can can do massive amounts of damage to you very quickly. Uh, but he is now dead, so main guns back to high explosive, very speed and course. And I am not spotted at this point, so oh no, never mind, I am detected again. There's still the Jutland sp um, uh, the Jutland spotting me, but we are to we are one kill ahead. And uh, we've got one destroyer running, running the other flank. So the team calls out uh, defend. And yes, I'm going to defend this flank. So there's no reason for me to hang around here. I'm going to head back towards the capture circle. Why am I doing that? Because there are fewer islands. And uh, while islands are my friend against big battleships, they are not my friend against uh, destroyers. So either way, I'm going to head back towards the capture circle. And I'm still spotted which means he's still within my detection range. There's another destroyer coming in from the other flank and uh, our friendly destroyer is going for the enemy cap. This can still go both ways. And uh, I don't have the range on the main guns to do anything about the destroyer in the capture circle, but I am spotted so that Jutland is within, is within um, my detection range. Now I'm unspotted. He's probably gone behind an island, but uh, I don't know which one. It could be the one right here. I'm gonna drop some torpedoes into this gap over there just to make sure and now I'm spotted again, so he's, he's, he could have come around besi uh, beside the island, or he's uh, coming around the other side. But that's why I'm just dropping some torpedoes in there. I'm not yet using the sonar, because I'm sailing away from the Jutland, so his torpedoes have to catch up to me anyway. And um, I, my job is just to keep him away from the capture circle. Now I'm unspotted again, which means that there's an, uh, there's an island, now I'm spotted again. Okay, sonar up to see, because now I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn in and see if I can get a shot at that thing. And uh, if he show if he makes a mistake and he's been hot on the sh on the chase and actually gets himself detected, I'm gonna slow down a little bit. I am sitting here full broadside because uh, once again um, I, be, I want I need that to get my 150s on target. But uh, there come the torpedoes. Okay, and so I know where the Jutland is and uh, I had already slowed down a little bit. Uh, he's somewhere probably he's either over there or he's been coming from the other side. But um, he's he's somewhere in that corner. And yeah, these torpedoes are not gonna kill me. So um, we'll just we'll just sit here and make it uncomfortable for the Jutland to to come anywhere near me. I mean, he he is obviously not stupid, and he's he knows exactly uh, like how far he can be away from me before he starts getting himself detected. But um, the thing is, we're capping, and he's the last one alive. So <laughs> since he's not getting through here, he's not counter capping, and even if he was, it wouldn't have helped him. But uh, we didn't know that a minute ago. Uh, okay, now we know where he is. He's right there. He's smoking up. So blind shots out and obviously again in full reverse. And uh, we'll see if we can... Uh, yep, there are some tracers coming in. But that's a British smoke. Yes, hello Mr. Jutland. I have some torpedoes. And, um, and then we're going to uh, just unload at you with the secondary. Secondary overload up. But because I am not fully broadsiding, because yes, there comes his torpedo spread again. Before, because I'm not fully broadsiding, uh, I, I can only get uh, a subset of the of the 150s on target and now the Jutland has gone undetected again because he's uh, stopped firing his guns. The thing is, um, while, while I haven't managed to kill the Jutland, he also hasn't managed to get through. So area denial is something that you can actually do in the ship relatively successfully and that's where the um, that's where the the, uh, the very good surface detection helps because it allows you to uh, to know that if a destroy if you're detected by a destroyer, it must be reasonably close because you only have a like 
what is it, like a nine nine odd kilometer uh, base uh, nine odd kilometer surface detection with the concealment module, and uh, that's how we win. It wasn't a glorious victory, but I think it shows very nicely how you can play the ship strategically and how you can use your um, your burst damage to your advantage and how you can use your surface detection to, uh, you know, just mess with destroyers and deter them because they you are very very dangerous and rushing you is often not advised so let's do that one again and in the second game it's domination on aurora nice map um, we're up against yamato colombo uh, vermont buffalo gearing and shima domination is neat because it well it, it allows for a bit more dynamic play than than base capture and Aurora does have some islands, but it also has some really tight spaces, which is not my favorite. But uh, it's better to play around the islands in this ship than to play out in the open, especially with a Vermont and a Yamato in the game. <laughs> because these things can can and will make very, very short work of you. All right, let's see where we're going. We're, we're spawning over at Sea Cup. Uh, this is a bit of a narrow gap here. So uh, secondaries to armor um, piercing, torpedoes to narrow spread. Uh, who do I have with me? I've got a Johan de Witt here. And the team calls out to capture B cup, so it looks like the team goes A and B. The thing is, I could, but um, is, I'm not sure if the David is coming with me. He's probably going to stick behind, the, stick next to the island. So uh, it, he's vulnerable if if anybody comes around C cup. Um, that could could end could end badly. And yes, the team is orienting towards the other two flanks, but I'm just gonna carefully inch over here. And keep this clean for the Johan de Witt, uh, such that he can make himself useful. And we haven't... Okay, we know where one of their destroyers is. It's at A cup. Well, no one's capping C yet. Okay, there's the Colombo. And uh, there are the three battleships. So they're all over there on the other side. Which, uh, these guys are my bigger problem. I've got nice flanking shots into them. But not opening up yet, because I want to see first who else, who else is here and uh, get myself into position. No, uh, no one's... Oh, no, there's the Buffalo. Okay. So is he is he coming alone? If he is, he's in trouble. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Buffalo. Uh, let me into oh gearing. Okay. Uh, now this is going to be interesting. Hydro up because I need to get the to prevent the gearing from smoking up. As long as the hydro is running, gearing is not going to smoke. So I'm going to go in reverse. I need to give somewhat of a broadside here, which is unfortunate. But um, uh, gearing is my biggest problem right now. So I'm secondary overload up and hopefully the big battleships on the left are not are not interested in me right now. And uh, just keep shooting at the gearing. Hydro is still running. Okay, Hydro is down. Torpedo's out. Let's see if he is making a turn. Just one spread. Mains over to high explosive. And he's still running up. He's not yet smoking. Okay, I would have assumed that he smokes by now, but he runs into two of the torpedoes and that shreds his... Uh, his rudder and at this range my auto secondaries are going to kill him absolutely outright. Now I have a bit of a problem because uh, not that buffalo there, he's not an issue. Uh, the the big guns on the other side are the issue so I am going to have to be a little bit more careful here about what I'm going to do and I'm going to try and uh, turn right and see if I can get myself behind these islands before things go south very very badly. Now, has Buffalo realized that I have torpedoes? Because I've still got one spread left, and that shot just came in from either the Yamato or from the Colombo. I'm not sure on the on the left side, but that hurt. Uh, yeah, I don't think Buffalo has figured out that I have torpedoes, and uh, Yamato is definitely trying to kill me at this point. I'm down to 7,000 hit points, but the Buffalo is down, and now I'm going to stop shooting and see if I can go undetected. Unfortunately, I have run into an island, and there comes another Yama salvo. So I do need to be a little bit careful here. Uh, doing a full turn because once once my bloom goes down mm, I should be able to go undetected before he gets the next salvo off uh, Come on any second now. Okay, it goes down now. So now I should go undetected and I okay There it goes and I think that might have been a little bit long. Yeah, there comes the salvo, but I got lucky uh, Surviving 3000 hit points, but now I'm undetected and now he has no way of spotting me easily Which means I can grab C cup and then uh, perform the original plan, which was to get around the corner and get myself behind an island. And in the meantime, the Yamato has run into a bunch of torpedoes. And that, has, that must have hurt. So I've got one launcher here. I'm going to get, get that out. Yep, the second launcher is damaged, so I'm not repairing that. But I have a heal coming off cooldown and uh, can recover a little bit of hit points. Now I'm spotted again, but I think Yamato has 
looked, uh, has looked elsewhere, so now he needs to realign his guns, and in the meantime I can get the, the turn completed. I uh, switched over to the high explosive for the, uh, for the secondary, secondary overload up, and then turn away as quickly as possible. And yeah, most of the Yama shells have either just hit the belt or splashed in the water harmlessly. And now using the speed of this thing just to get uh, to get some islands between myself and that Yamato. And he's stopping, but um, he's uh, gonna run into one or two of those torpedoes. And yep, yeah, it's two torpedoes. And now I am getting behind the island, which means I'm no longer spotted, which means that Yamato is now, unless he unless he blind fires, not gonna be able to hit me anymore. I'm going to slow down just in case he does that, but uh, my main guns are almost reloaded and let's see if we can get across the island because I can still see him because he's sitting out in open water. So shots out and uh, yeah, the dis dispersion sometimes works reasonably well. I mean, it's four, four out of eight on target, which is kind of average, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's workable. Unfortunately, he's just out of, my, out of my secondary range, but I can inch a little bit back to get a clearer shot and uh, still lob these shells over the island. Let's see if I can get him killed. And uh, that doesn't look bad. Six out of eight, but uh, would have would have needed one more. And I think someone's just going to sink the Yamato at this point because uh, before my guns are reloading and uh, he's not in secondary range. So yeah, Shimakaze kills him. So that's that. I think the rest of the enemy team is all the way on the other flank, but we've cleaned that one up relatively comprehensively. Now, obviously gearing, um, I'm not sure what, what his plan was in the beginning, but uh, in worst case we would have traded, I guess, because I, I did still have a second torpedo launch already in case he was going to do a smoke and turn. But uh, with a destroyer you've got to be very careful rushing these things, because they have lots of torpedoes and they've basically got a Nuremberg strap to each side of them. Uh, is this line worth grinding? I still maintain that you need to be prepared to lose occasionally and uh, not be able to do an awful lot because if you don't get s the situations where you can where you can make the ships work then you know you'd kind of need to play within seven eight kilometers of range i mean you uh, the secondaries have uh, have a longer range but it's it's doable it's it's absolutely doable and you can have great absolutely great games in these ships they have an amazing damage output just be prepared that it doesn't always work like that. Make sure you try to get into one-on-one uh, -on -one fights and uh, maintain your cover. Play it more like a really, really heavily armed cruiser than an actual battleship because the armor does not hold up extremely well against the large guns in the game. But with uh, 57,000 hit points, you are, you've got a bit more wiggle room than in tier nine to you know still play a bit with, uh, with the health and then get undetected, recover, and then uh, get out again and do, you know, do what you do best, which is doing a lot of damage. So yeah, for, for me, this, uh, the, this, this line is, is fun. It's great fun and uh, it's, it's got a relatively high skill floor because you need, um, you, you need good situational awareness and you need to know where, uh, where the shots are coming from and uh, you need to disengage when, when, you, ca when, when you have to. So definitely takes a bit of takes a bit of practice, but uh, it's it's great fun and it's uh, it's a worthy addition in in my opinion. It's not overpowered, but it's a good addition to the general gameplay. So yeah, that was the Schliefen, and uh, that's it for me today. Thanks everybody, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.